So draconic astrology, um, it's uh, a specialist astrology technique. Now, I don't know whether you're all astrologers or whether you're interested in astrology. So I'm gonna keep this talk very light. Um, there are lots of technical details, which I'm not really gonna go into today. Um, I'm only speaking about half an hour and then I'll take some questions and answers from you. Um, the word draconic means dragon-like, as you can see the picture there. And it goes back to ancient times, Babylon, especially Mesopotamia, when it was believed um, that dragons resided in the nodes. Now, these are the lunar nodes, the moon's nodes. And what is a node? Um, it's not actually a planet. It's not actually a place. It's actually a point. And it's the point where the mood, uh, the moon, I should say, um, intersects the sun's pathway or, or otherwise known as the eclipse. In other words, they sort of cross over each other. And at the central point is, is the point, is the node. And there are two nodes the south node and the north node. And that's the starting point for draconic astrology. And what it tries to do is, as Carl said, find your sole purpose. Now we all ask the question in life, don't you? Don't we, we why are we here? What is my purpose? And during the COVID lockdown, a lot of people started coming to me with that very question. They'd, they had time to ask themselves, well, why am I living my life, which is so unsatisfactory or unfulfilling? Why am I spending a fifth of my time on a train? Or why am I doing a job that I find unfulfilling or um, stifling? Or why am I in a life situation or in a repeat type relationship? Well, what's happening? And I think the principle of draconic astrology, before we just go through a few explanations and then a few charts, is that it's the idea that if you have a better understanding of your life, then you're more likely not to repeat the same mistakes. And often that's evident in relationships. Now, what we do with a draconic chart is that we create a new chart by looking at the North and the South node. Now, just if you don't know what the nodes look, oh, there's my book. Now this is the, uh, many of you will know this, but so bear with me because some of you won't be familiar, but the image on, well, the, image on the right is the, um, the South node and is associated with things that we are familiar with. It's really those things which represent our gifts that we're born with and so forth. Um, whereas the North Node on the left, the Caput Draconis as it's called, represents the life challenges. Now, these two nodes, which are always opposite each other, you will find in a birth horoscope or in an event horoscope. And usually what people do is they look at the sign and the house and the degree in which and on which these nodes fall. But draconic astrology goes one step further. It actually sets up a new chart. So if you take your birth chart, the horoscope, what you do, and I'm not gonna go through this um, in too much detail, what, what you do is that you move the natal north node to nought degrees Aries. And why nought degrees Aries? Because in astrology, that's the start of the new year. That's the start of the calendar, um, nought degrees Aries in the northern hemisphere. And it's the same in the southern hemisphere too. I know that the southern hemisphere is all reversed, the seasons. But in astrology, everything defaults to the northern hemisphere. So whether you're born in Australia or whether you're born in London, it's the same principle. The natal north node is moved to the vernal equinox point, the nought degrees Aries. Then you take the number of degrees and minutes between the two, and then you move the rest of the chart to create a draconic chart. The only difference is that the planets don't change houses. They actually stay in the same house. You've got Mars in the first house, it stays in the first house. But what's changed are the signs and the degrees. Now, to some of you, that's too technical because you're not trained astrologers, but I'm assuming many of you are familiar with astrology, so you're sort of following me. I'm not going to go through these rules. There's no point. Um, one, one or two things to note, though, about the, um, the lunar nodes is that they always move in retrograde. It's one of those strange things in the chart. Um, it's certainly the case. There are two types of node, but I wouldn't worry about that at this stage. All you need to know is that in general, they move backwards through the chart. So at the moment, the North Node is moving backwards through Taurus and is just actually moving away from Uranus. 
So that may explain why there's been so many dramatic and um, unreal happenings in the world in the last few weeks. Um, you can set up the Draconic chart very quickly. If you're familiar with astrology, you can set up very fast on astro.com, for example. You just go to the chart type. And once you've got your birth details, opt for the Draconic chart under chart type. If you've got solar fire, go to zodiac type. So create your horoscope first in what we call the tropical system. That's just the ordinary horoscope. You can do sidereal as well. Whether it's sidereal or tropical, once you put the draconic option in, it will create the draconic chart for you. And it will be the same whether it's tropical or sidereal. Also, just for your information, the draconic system has its own ephemeris. So the draconic system actually has its own zodiac. And you may ask yourself, well, What's so different about the moon chart, which is what the draconic chart is, as opposed to a sun chart? Well, think about what the moon represents. I think we had some quotes earlier on. I'll go back. Um, the moon is associated with history. It's associated with your family roots. It's associated with memory and habit. And some astrologers actually also relate it to past lives. I mean, someone like Anna Isabel, for example, who's a sort of esoteric astrologer, will go back through your past life. Personally, I, I will allude to past lives, but I don't know anything about them really. I don't actually see them in the horoscope, but I'm prepared to accept that the soul, whatever that may be, and we all have different ideas about the soul, but the soul may have a prenatal existence. It may have a post-death existence, who knows? But certainly what I focus on is what we can determine within this incarnation, within this life, and so, in a way, the nodal axis describes the narrative of our lives from where we are comfortable or where we have certain default characteristics or certain habits and ways of doing things. And then we're set the challenge by the North Node. This is what we are striving to do in this life, what we're aiming to do to, to feel fulfillment. Now, you may say, well, that's a bit of a tall order. Well, there's no harm in trying. Let's put it like that. And it's very interesting that so many people, from my perspective, in my practice, are asking that question, particularly now, as we are going through uncertain times. And we've had this strange hiatus when we had the lockdown. Most extraordinary situation. Now, um, is there anything I need to tell you about that? Now, I'm not going to go into any more about the nodal facts because then we're going into a different kind of talk. It did strike me as sensible that it would be a good idea to show you how it works in practice. And why, who else but Queen Elizabeth II? Uh, you may say to me, well, her life purpose was obvious. Well, if it's obvious that she should be queen <laughs> and all that is associated with it, then we should try to find that in the chart. So let's see what we see. Now, there are three stages to assessing someone's life purpose. And it's not fortune cookie. It's not, it's not a fortune cookie process where I come up with a one liner at the end. You were born to do this. Also, soul purpose is not just about career. It's a, it's a lot to do about other things, too. Emotional challenges. Are you, for example, a control freak? Or do you have a problem dealing with other people's independence? Or are you always drawn to control freaks? I mean, there are so many things going on here. There are be, it, it, there is countless the number of possibilities and each chart is unique. Now, if we look at the Queen's chart, um, we see that, um, now that's the Traconic chart. So I've sh showed you the wrong chart actually, sorry about that. This is her tropical chart. This is the actual birth chart uh, of the Queen. So we'll see that her moon is just in Taurus, it's only 12 minutes in. So there's quite a strong Aries energy in the Queen. And I think that was expressed in her physical robustness, her love of sport and things like that. Uh, we also see um, on this side, the left side, Mars and Jupiter together in Aquarius. So there's quite an adventurous streak in her in many ways. But the, the first clue as to her responsibility lies with this association up in the 11th. Some of the house systems will put it in the 10th house. But we've got Saturn next to the Midheaven. The Midheaven has to do with life direction. It's in Scorpio. So this is a deeply ingrained passion, a commitment, a dedication. So there is something already in the, um, 
in the tropical chart, this is the ordinary horoscope that warns us that she carries heavy responsibilities. I've got my Saturn next to NC. In the old astrology system, that's regarded as a bad thing. Well, it didn't do the queen any harm, did it? Um, the other thing we're looking at, I mean, there's lots of things going on in this chart and that we don't have time to go into it all. But the thing I'm looking for, look, this is the nodal axis. So the south node is rising on her ascendant point there. It's virtually exactly conjunct, which is appropriate, really, because how I read that is it's in Capricorn. Capricorn is associated with formal duties, with tradition with responsibilities, sometimes state responsibilities. Obviously, because we know that we're looking at the Queen's chart, we can particularize a little bit through the signs. So having Capricorn rising is very appropriate because it already settles her almost default position with heavy responsibilities. But the, di the direction of travel is over here on the North Node, which is interesting because the North Node is in Cancer, which is interesting because She's her starting point has a lot to do with dehumanizing tradition, but cancer has a lot to do with humanizing emotion. It's all about relating to people close to us or to family. Of course, in the national sense, and remember the land, she her son in the fourth house. The fourth house is the domain of the land, the people, as well as one's family. But over on the descendant point, which is the outer world, to have the north node in cancer suggests that. Her, Part of her life purpose was to humanize herself within the context of tradition. That's the first starting point for the interpretation of her chart. It doesn't answer the, her draconic purpose, because when we look at a draconic chart, we're going to see a lot more. Um, it's, this is known, incidentally, for those of you interested in furthering your astrological studies as a bucket shaped chart. Half of it is full, the other half only has Saturn as a principal planet, as the handle. So Saturn has a raise, not only is Saturn the ruler of this chart, but Saturn rules Capricorn, but it's also the lead planet for um, the chart itself. So there's a heavy emphasis here on responsibilities. Let's move on. Now, this is the draconic chart. Now, at first sight, you think, well, what's changed? Nothing's changed. Look again. Notice now that Libra is rising, which is interesting because this is the draconic chart. What we've done is that we've moved the North Node. If we go back a moment, North Node's in Cancer. So we've calculated the distance between the North Node and North Degrees Aries. And the result is that the Sun now falls in Capricorn. Now, what I've found with draconic charts is that they often make more literal things that you know already or maybe hinted at in the tropical chart. It's almost as if what might be hinted at becomes a screaming headline. So her son, which is her identity, now is in Capricorn, which when you think about it is entirely appropriate because her person embodied responsibility and tradition, which is what Capricorn is all about. Notice also that Saturn and MC now are not in Capricorn, but are in Leo, which we know is the royal sign. And in fact, the MC and Saturn and Sun, and that's uh, Chiron down there, are actually in what we call a quincunx mutual reception. In other words, Saturn, um, uh, in other words, Sun is ruling uh, Capricorn down here, and Saturn rules them down here. So, and the Sun rules the Saturn MC up here. So, in other words, it's what we call a mutual reception. Um, it, they're very supportive of each other, even though it's a quincunx. I mean, there are awkwardnesses with that. It means she's got to compromise a great deal. But what I'm trying to get across is that in the draconic chart, we have a, a greater sense of what her life responsibilities are, and she carries a heavy weight. I mean, there are other things about her that are not apparent in this chart, but we're going to go to the third stage in a minute where an amazing thing is revealed. And let's jump to it now. Notice also before I move that she has Pluto close to the North Node in Pisces, which invests her with quite a strong spiritual importance, which of course has to do with her being the head of the church. There are other things that we can connote it to, but that is one of the big significances about that. Um, let's move now. Now, this is the third stage of the analysis. Now, before I 
you know, I, you, I'm not expecting you to understand this, child. Allow me to be your eyes. But one of the strange things about the Queen's position or the monarch's position in Britain is that the monarch doesn't actually possess much in the way of executive power. They're head of state, but they have no executive power. And they sign off bills. I mean, you get the red boxes, they sign off the bills, they give the royal assent. And that seems that no law can come into being without the Queen's consent or the King's consent. That's absolutely true. But it's unheard of for the monarch to actually not give royal assent. It would actually lead to a constitutional crisis and the likely removal of the monarchy. So everything is symbolic and nothing seems to be what it actually is. And what we find in the draconic bywheel here, just to explain to you what we're looking at, we're actually looking at the Queen's inner wheel, which is her birth chart, which we looked at already. So we see that Sun is in Taurus. But interestingly now, if we apply the draconic birth chart round here, we find that Neptune is sitting almost exactly on her Sun. Now, this is very significant, and it's not apparent in her birth chart, tropical, or birth chart, draconic, but becomes apparent when you compare the two charts, which is what you do in draconic analysis. Neptune actually brings with it all sorts of strange diffusive energies. It's a shapeless thing. It's nebulous. It's glamorous. Neptune has no borders. Um, it's optical illusion. We associate movies and glamour with Neptune. In other words, what you see is not necessarily what it is. So you're watching a movie and after a while you're convinced it's real. You're looking at reality. But actually what you're looking at is recorded light. And so what this is telling me draconically is that there is something about her role in life which is glamorous, which uh, has grandeur because it has uh, an optical impression upon people, but it's not what it seems. It's almost as if she has to play a Neptunian role in her life role. And I think you can see where I'm going with this in terms of the fact that she was highly representative. She represented the state. It's very interesting that this conjunction is in the fourth house. The fourth house is that of the land, the nation, the people. Um, there are other things going on in this chart, by the way, but um, I'm only focusing on the, the central points because we don't have time to uh, to examine the whole chart. It, it's not, although it is quite interesting if you go to the seventh house that the um, the draconic MC and Saturn are sitting on the moon. So this relates the idea of family, the land, and so forth with royalty. In the seventh house, of other people, the outside world. So there are lots of subtleties and nuances going on in this thing. Um, let's have another look. Now, this is an amazing, this is the Queen's chart. I'll explain what we've, I've done here. The inner wheel is the tropical chart of the United Kingdom, which was created in 1801, would you believe? There are other British charts, but the 1801 is pretty reliable. And what we've got on the outside, um, I'm just gonna move something is the um, Queen's draconic chart. In other words, so what we're doing, we're looking at Britain's natal chart in the inner wheel, and the outer wheel is now the Queen's draconic chart. In other words, what is her spiritual purpose in relation to Britain? Now, of course, that's a big question, isn't it? You know, we're not all born a monarch, <laughs> uh, nor was she actually, but she did become a monarch very early in life. Now, look at the most extraordinary thing that's happened. The two sons, which represent the identities of the two factors involved here, the nation and the monarch, they're on exactly the same degree in Capricorn. In fact, they're only separated by five minutes. That's down at the bottom there. I don't know whether you can see my cursor moving around, but look at that. That is the most amazing exact conjunction. And what does that mean? It, it shows that she was a sort of embodiment of the nation, which I know is symbolic. I mean, some of you will say, well, also she, you know, she was highly privileged that she didn't really seem to do anything. Well, I think it's unfair to say that. You can question the value of what she did, but I don't think one can say that she just sat about all day. But in symbolic terms, in terms of the constitution, she embodied the state. And if you listen to many of the uh, tributes to her, you know, many people sort of muddle her up with Britain. 
It's like she was Britain and Britain was her. I mean, again, I know it's, it's slightly hyperbolic to say that, but in the symbolic terms of the constitution, the British constitution is very strange. It's, put up, it's full of woo-woo. There's a lot of tradition, look at the way they dress. Look at the rituals they go through. There's a strong mystical traditional thing running through the British constitution. And at the top of it is the monarch. That's the role that poor King Charles III is gonna struggle with. I'm not gonna go into his chart today, but he's gonna struggle with that. But the queen was born for it. She was born to embody the nation. We don't have this conjunction in Charles's chart, I'm afraid to say, we have something quite different. But we also find that the Mercuries are very close together here. If you see my cursor in Sagittarius in the third house. Um, and also, if you look over to the sixth house, I mean, the part of fortune is touched by all the, the North Node, Pluto. The, I mean, in other words, there's something very um, uh, beneficial about this chart. And also up at the top, we find that the nation's Jupiter in Leo is conjunct her draconic Saturn. So this is a blending of authority with growth or with majesty because it's in Leo. We've got time to look at someone else. Britney Spears, another queen of sorts. <laughs> you could say, well, why am I only looking at famous people? Well, I do have my own chart, but um, the reason why we look at famous people's charts is simply because they're more extreme. You can actually, we all know who they are, so we can see how it works. And, and at some fundamental level, they're no different from us. They just have to be famous. Um, and they've had some fortune in being recognized and all that stuff. Now, so this is uh, Britney Spears' um, tropical chart. So you see that she's uh, a vibrant Sagittarius. Uh, funnily enough, I'm not seeing this to be as creative as I would expect it to be. She has part of fortune up here in Leo. But the, what I want to draw your attention to is something else. We all know what happened to her recently. You know, she was in a conservative conservatorship for 14 or 15 years. This is a, a sort of guardianship that um, they have in America. And it was uh, thought a few years back that she was mentally incompetent or that she was mentally ill and that she wasn't capable of running her own life. But then thanks to a public campaign, and it was a very long campaign, she managed to extricate herself from this guardianship, this conservatorship. And her father is very much associated with the conservatorship. He actually ran it. And I now know that we now all know that there is a conflict between daughter and father and also between daughter and family. It's not a happy situation. She feels that she was stifled and restricted. Now, what's that got to do with her life purpose? Well, let's go through it. This is step one. Um, the chart ruler is Venus because Libra is rising. So Venus is very important in a chart. It's not a happy Venus in Capricorn, it has to be said. Um, Capricorn is about restriction. Venus is about the things that we love. And not many people love restriction. And also um, Saturn is associated with the father. I and mean, some people associate the son with the father, but I associate it with Saturn. Um, if you look, you'll see that Venus is exactly square her, her Pluto. And her Pluto is conjunct Saturn. So in other words, we have a square mutual reception. In other words, Venus rules or disposits Saturn and Saturn rules Venus. Now, ordinarily would say, oh, it's a square. So that's a challenge. That means restriction. That means there are struggles with authority or struggles with the father over freedom, things like that. But the complication is Pluto, which brings in issues of power. So we have additional power intensities going on here. And that's just from the tropical chart. We can already see problems. It's interesting too that the midheaven, the life directions in cancer, which is the family, which is identifying realization through family, but we still, it's not still not quite clear to me where we are with, I mean, it's a bit like the queen. She's, you know, she had North Node in cancer. The MC life direction in, in cancer is much more to do with finding your own family or finding liberation from family. Those are the sort of issues. Let's look at the draconic. Uh, this is still Britney Spears's birth chart, but we've converted it to the draconic. Remember that we have to interpret the draconic chart differently now. Uh, we're looking at the themes of the moon. Now, what's very interesting to me 
is that Venus now becomes stronger. We say stronger because if we go back a moment, it's in Capricorn, it doesn't like being in Capricorn, but when it moves into Libra, that's an interest, that's what we call a promotion because it's going into its dignity, Venus rules Libra. So this is a strong indicator to the draconic astrologer that things to do with Venus, that's relationship mainly, it can be to do with lifestyle too, but relationship is the major theme of Venus, uh, the way we interact with others, our awareness of other people. And it's in Libra. So there's a strong potential for her to realize herself through relationship. But it's also the challenge she faces in life. Her challenges have a lot more to do with emotions. You might say, oh, well, she's a great big pop star. She's a le living legend. Yeah, she's a living legend. But what's that got to do with life purpose? The life purpose for her has more to do with emotional struggle and liberation. And look where Saturn is. It's in Gemini now, which is interesting. So the, there's still the square. There's still the square between Venus and Pluto and Saturn, but all it, they're separated now. If you remember, um, they were both in Libra before. Now, they're in, Saturn's in Gemini, Pluto's in Cancer. They've become separate. They're still sort of conjunct, but out of sign conjunct. They're separated. And it, Cancer brings in the family. It's a, a heavy hint. There are power issues in the family. But Saturn in Gemini is hope. It's the communicator. Gemini can be the liberator, the freer. We still have the square. The draconic challenge is to find freedom. That's how you would interpret this in the draconic terms. Remember, you've got to immerse yourself in the draconic system to fully understand where I'm going with this, but I'm just giving you the speeded up version. Let's have a quick look at the third stage. Now, the third stage, I'm just gonna, I've got this box and I've got to keep moving around. So what are we looking at here? The, the inner wheel is Britney Spears' um, ordinary birth chart. So, you know, she's got all that Sagittarius energy. Um, it's interesting that the outer world is her draconic birth chart. It's interesting to see all that Leo. So we have a final recognition spiritually that she has strong creative energies, which are not always evident in the tropical chart. It's the draconic chart that makes that clearer. But what about the issue to do with family and power? Look right at the top of the chart. Isn't it interesting that Pluto, which is the planet of power struggle, of hidden themes, sometimes dark themes, to do with sexuality or to do with money or to do with psychology and manipulation. It's sitting right on top, exactly on top of her midheaven point at the top of the chart. In other words, her life direction is subject to the draconic challenge of undergoing transformation within a family or tribal situation. And when you see that sort of conjunction, it usually indicates that there are dark secrets, power issues to be addressed, and that she needs to address them. Um, these, these energies are very, um, no, I'm not even gonna recognize that as an opposition, but there you are, that's a very clear indication that she, um, that that is one of, part of her big draconic purpose. It's very interesting too, that the draconic Venus now is, uh, rising almost exactly um, in Libra, um, which suggests to me that relationship and finding her equilibrium within relationship is a, is a life challenge. Um, but usually through conflict, because it's actually widely conjunct Mars in Virgo. That's a very weak conjunction, but it's sufficient because Venus is very close to the South Node and the South Node just about takes in Mars. So she has to expect that she may encounter struggle and she needs to fight for her, her equilibrium. It's also interesting to see that draconic Mars up in the eighth house here, I'm indicating it in Gemini, is exactly opposite Uranus. So this is a very sure sign of um, disruptive conflict is how I would put it. I mean, I'm choosing my words carefully because there could be litigation um, uh, expected between daughter and father at some point. The issue still being investigated about whether, conserva whether the conservatorship was uh, properly managed. So I can't 
follow through the full logic of what's being suggested here in the chart. But to me, what's being told is that much of her life purpose, yes, there's the career, yes, her, there's her legendary status, and you would think that that's all that matters. But actually what really matters is her emotional equilibrium, but also liberation and a transformation that must take place within the family. And I think also with Pluto and the MC, she finds freedom, and this is me now extrapolating, that she finds freedom through her own family, not necessarily through family of origin, but through her own family. Whether she's gonna get it, I don't know. You know, we're not talking about promises, we're talking about potential here, because let's talk about me, my favorite subject. <laughs> um, I'll keep this very, because I've got a frightening chart to show you, it's gonna horrify you. Um, I said, you, said to you earlier that the birth chart will sometimes reveal to you certain realities about yourself. The thing to notice about my birth chart, you see I'm a Gemini, you wouldn't have guessed it by the way, I wrap it on. But I've got Venus exactly opposite Saturn. Now, anyone who knows anything about astrology knows that's one of the worst aspects you can have in your chart. It basically means I'm a raving sociopath. But it also means that the problems that are indicated with a Saturn-Venus opposition can improve with age. So I'm now charm personified. I can give a very good impression of somebody, if somebody you, you, you know you want to share a car with. But that might have not been the case many years back. I've basically evolved through pain. Now, that, it, that Venus in Gemini, yeah, okay, that's fine. That's not necessarily problematic. It's the exact opposition to Saturn that's the problem. So that can, I mean, there's a squares to the moon and one thing and another two, all sorts of hideous um, aspects going on. I mean, we all look at our birth chart and we think, good God, how do I get up in the morning? Here's the draconic. Now, you know, we saw in Britney Spears, Venus was elevated to Libra. Same things happened to me because I faced big social problems in my life. I don't know why, but I seem to have born with a, a certain antipathy to people. I mean, it's not something to admit to people that you hope will buy your book, but I think I've become a slightly nicer person. But in my draconic chart, Venus is now elevated to Libra. So this tells me that relationships, getting on with other people is a big central purpose. And in fact, I can create a new life because Saturn's in Aries. Aries is the starting point in the Zodiac. What's interesting too, in another sense, because remember astrology works on different levels, is that, that Sun and Venus are in the fourth house. This identifies family as very important to me, but the fourth house can be the domain of the mother. And just as if to confirm that point, draconic moon is now elevated because moon rules cancer to cancer in the first house. In other words, something about the family, something about the mother maybe, could be the father too, but I think it's the mother because of what I'm about to show you. Somehow my life responsibility, sole responsibilities is partly to do with my mum. I know it's a weird thing to say, but in terms of responsibility, and there are sort of biographical things I could say about why that is. Uh, I mean, she was Italian, she was a, a woman in a foreign land and she never really assimilated. So she became, and also um, my father left the family, blah, 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 blah. So I became very responsible for her. And so, you know, Freudians listening to this will have a field day, but just take me at my word that that's how I'm reading it. Now this chart I'm about to show you, and it'd be the final chart I show, will frighten the hell out of you. Um, but you don't have to understand it. Just follow my guidance, okay? Now, what you're looking at here is a death chart, and it's the death chart of my mother. She died on the 6th of January, 2019, under a, uh, uh, under a solar eclipse in Capricorn. You can see that here. Um, it's the third wheel out. Uh, very quickly to explain, if I can remember this, the inner wheel, the first wheel is my birth chart. The second is the draconic. The third are the tropical transits for the day. In other words, where the planets were, in the sky at the moment of her death. And the, th the fourth wheel is the draconic transits. Now, bear in mind that the draconic chart and the tropical chart are where the planets were at my birth. It was foretold, if you like. Now, when my mother died, it's very interesting. As she was dying, tr tropical transiting Neptune came into conjunction with draconic Neptune and tropical moon. Now, what's the significance of that? 
This is how I interpret it. Neptune doesn't just represent nebulous things or optical illusion. It can also represent loss. And it also represents care. And I was responsible to an extreme extent for my mum. I mean, I cared for her for the last 10 years of her life. That gives you a measure of that thing. It didn't actually stop me from doing what I had to do in my life or what I wanted to do, but it was that added responsibility, which I recognized from an early age, you know, when I was from about 12. And it's very interesting, as transiting Neptune, Neptune started to conjoin draconic Neptune and moon, which are conjunct as you see, she started to die. And about the same time, the draconic Neptune up at the top, I hope you can see it, was in a trine to this. So how do I interpret that? I remember saying to Frank C. Clifford, you may know him, months before she died, I bet when Neptune hits my draconic Neptune and my tropical moon, my mother dies. Well, that's more or less what happened. In other words, it was representing a release from a responsibility through the conjunction. And just as a final observation, because there's a lot else going on in this chart that's significant, but on the very day she died, the tropical north node was in Cancer, exactly conjunct my draconic moon, which you would say is the starting point of a release because the north node is your destiny point. The moon is the mother or the family in Cancer, which is the sign of the family of the mother of the tribe. And also, by the way, just as a matter of noticing it, on the day of the uh, Capricorn solar eclipse, which is in old astrology associated with passings and the end of things, um, in draconic terms, the solar eclipse was opposite the two Neptunes and the moon. Uh, not on these degrees, but um, they actually the actual eclipse started on 18 degrees, which puts it opposite these celestial so there any questions well you embody everything actually um, but we have to make distinctions about what we're talking about uh, sole purpose is one thing and that's partly to do with the nodal axis the midheaven has to do with life direction which is not always the sole purpose. Often we associate life direction with career. Um, that's not always the case though. We don't all have careers and not all of us have a sense of vocation either, but we can have a life direction in terms of actual physical responsibilities and things like that. Or we recognize that life, in, excuse me, involves us in certain things. So you do embody the midheaven as you do the other points in the chart, such as the ascendant, um, and as to the ruler, well, yes, you, you might consider the ruler, but you can't look at one point to the exclusion of other things. And what I encourage draconic astrologers to do is to look at uh, the moon phase under which the person is uh, born in. You know, are they born in a balsamic last phase of the moon? Were they born at the start of the, of the phase? That will tell you something about the energies. I also encourage astrologers to look at the chart shape. Is it a bowl? Is it a bucket? Um, you know, there, there are loads and loads of different charts. There's a great book out there by Wanda Seller on chart shaping. That's an amazing, gives amazing insights even before you looked at the birth chart properly, because that just looks at the pattern that is formed by the planetary array. So I don't, I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly, but certainly you do embody the midheaven point, but there are a lot of other things you've got to consider. Like the suns, for example, we look in my chart, for example, I start with a Gemini sun. I'm a Gemini, but my draconic says I'm Libra. But that doesn't make me a Libra. I've seen on Facebook uh, draconic um, practitioners say, oh, I, I, or somebody who doesn't know much about draconic. Oh, I'm a, I'm a draconic Libra. And I always felt more Libra than Gemini. Well, that's not really the way it works. What the Libra sun is asking you to do is to work much more towards relationship, to focus on relationship, because probably you're encountering problems either in terms of partnerships or friends or how people react to you in general. These are the things that you have to, uh, I mean, you come back at me with a question if you want to.
Well, Saturn has to do with restriction, inhibition. These are the sort of associations. It's also to do with a lot of good things too, responsibilities. Um, if we don't have a sense of responsibility, then we, we end up doing nothing. So even when you look at a planet that we call a malefic, it, it's a bit misleading to say that. But Saturn is to do with restriction, inhibition, and with slowness of pace. Venus has to do with fun. It's to do with self expression in the emotional sense. You know, we associate it with love. In another sense, Venus has a lot to do with the things that we like to do, you know, because we associate it with um, luxury, lifestyle, fashion. Now, when you've got them in an opposition, in other words, 180, 180 degrees apart, you've got conflicting energies. You've got Saturn who wants to own you. Oh, but you've got Venus that wants to own you. And you've got a struggle between the two. And what can happen is that, in a sense, Saturn restricts you. Saturn makes you feel inhibited. It makes you feel shy. It kind of stifles you. And I have to say that I was a very extreme example of that. It may seem incredible now the way I'm screaming on, but that's the way it was right up, you know, things got better from about my Saturn return, about the age of 27, 28, 29. You know, a lot of people change around that time. So the great thing about Saturn, though, when it's in a square or opposition, is that if you learn some of the lessons, if you recognize the inhibition and realize that you're seeing people perhaps in a negative light, you learn from it so that as you grow older, you start to assimilate both the energies and synthesize them. So I still have a strength, a strong sense of responsibility. I'm still purposeful, which is Saturnian. But I've always had quite a hedonistic side to myself, and I've managed to marry them together. That's a great question, actually. Um, to do a draconic solar return, uh, you have to do two things. The first is you have to get your, you do the tropical chart first, obviously, but then you've got to convert that into a tropical chart. You then get the tropical solar return and turn that into a draconic solar return. Um, and that's the proper reading. But, I mean, if you read Pam Crane's book, that's the only way to do it. I think that's what she says. But and Pam Crane's also written a book on draconic astrology. It's a much thicker book than mine, but I've approached it as an introduction. But so to do a proper solar return in the draconic system, you've got to have the draconic birth chart tropical and the draconic solar return. But I am in the habit of mixing. And sometimes I'll look at the draconic solar return in relation to the tropical. I'll play around with it. I'll give you one small example um, about Donald Trump. Um, before he lost lost the election in 2015, um, it was 2015, wasn't it? And he, I was asked by a magazine who was going to win the election, Hillary or Donald Trump? Not, no, no, what am I talking about? No, the, the, the election afterwards, sorry, the one with Joe Biden. Uh, I'm thinking about another chart. So the Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, who would win the presidential election? In, it was 2020, wasn't it? Now. Um, a magazine asked me that question. So what I did was I drew up a draconic chart for Donald Trump. And, uh, you know, if anyone's looked at his birth chart, it's pretty horrifying. He's got a full moon, Uranus stuck between North Node and Uranus. It's an amazing sight. And he's got Mars rising as well. So no one was ever going to suggest that he was a, a peace loving fella. Um, but when I did the draconic on draconic, what came up was the entire 10th and 11th houses were dominated by Aries energy, about six or seven planets in Aries. And the 10th and 11th is associated with presidency, government, you know, in mundane astrology, that's the associations. And I deduced, because remember, charts don't talk to you, it's not like a Hollywood oracle speaking to you from a, gray, uh, from a cave with Charlton Heston's voice. Um, you have to make a deduction. And I thought, well, if Donald Trump is seeking more of the same, in other words, re-election, you're not going to find it with Aries because Aries is the sign that starts the Zodiac. It's a fresh new life. So 
in a few sentences, I said, no, he's going to lose because he's going in a new direction. He'll never be president again, by the way. So that's a very long winded answer to your question, isn't it? That's a lot to do with, um, well, it depends on whether you're talking about this, the draconic chart or the tropical chart, but in general terms, it has to do with relationship. And usually you know, when I'm doing clients, if the North Node's falling in the, let's say the tropical seventh, and it'll be, it'll be the same in the draconic seventh as well, by the way, but the signs and the, the degrees will be different. Usually that means that there'll be issues to do with, um, independence within relationship or um, preserving your independence in relationship or on working on the dynamics of relationship. I mean, I started um, with, shall we say, social incapacities. Some people these days would say I'm on the spectrum, but frankly, the pathologizing of behavior, I think is unfortunate because often a chart will show up certain cosmic energies that reflect what you know about yourself. So sometimes there is a need to address the dynamics of relationship and actually working with other people. So I would distill the North Node in the seventh house as your life purpose is working through joint efforts, through negotiation, through compromise. Um, and if you've got Mars there as well, God help you. <laughs> Well, the interesting thing, well, first of all, I'm not a Vedic astrologer, so I, I can't really answer that question authoritatively. But I do know that the, 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 the Vedic astrology and uh, Western tropical recognize the North Nodes and make similar associations. But I don't personally know of any Vedic astrologer who actually practices draconic astrology. What I can say to you is that, of course, Vedic astrology is based on sidereal astrology. So the starting point for the year is different from the tropical. I don't want to get into the technical detail about this, but I have to say, and I, this may become a, a subject of controversy um, as time goes on, but if you go to any software program at the moment in the Western system, then you'll find that even if you put up a sidereal chart, um, it will actually be treated uh, for the purposes of draconic as a tropical chart in effect. But as to, I mean, remember in the Vedic system, there are many different uh, subsystems as well. And um, I mean, I mean the, the whole house system is very different too. So it, it's a bit difficult for me to answer your question because I'm not a Vedic, um, but I would be fascinated to know. That's a great question, actually. Um, I've always been interested in esoteric, if you might, if you don't mind my saying it that way. I, you know, I've always been much more focused on spiritual spiritualism, that sort of thing. And I always felt that the just looking at the nodal axis in itself only took you halfway along the journey. You know, I know that there are books out there that only focus on the nodes in the tropical system, but I just felt always dissatisfied. Um, with the answers I gave people. I tended to, to be perfectly honest with you, look too much at the midheaven. And the nodes will give you some sense of sole purpose, but not the whole story. Then I read Pam Crane's book, The Draconic Chart, which is a fabulous book. It's huge, it's vast, it's definitive. But I'm, an, I'm a journalist and I, my particular skills lie in being a communicator and making things very accessible. So I decided that I wanted to make the subject a lot more accessible. And as I learned the system and I pay um, a great tribute to Pam Crane, who's a fabulous genius, she's a wonderful astrologer. Um, but as I started to work on charts, I noticed I was getting answers. I already knew the answers in a way because I was working on the charts of people that I knew famous writers, famous actors, royalty, that sort of stuff. And that queen chart that I showed you, you know, the, her draconic chart on Britain was a humdinger. And also, if you look at people um, in Hollywood, for example, um, you know, it's remarkable what's shown up. 
And so what you get with Draconic is a more refined answer. Also, I always say about Draconic that it speaks in headline news. It, it becomes almost obvious. It's, it's amazing. So to me, Draconic is like applying a microscope to one area of the horoscope. And of course, what the microscope does is to magnify it. But you're looking at yourself through the moon. You're looking at the emotions, you're looking at the past, you're looking at instincts. And it's amazing to look at a chart from that perspective. So I got answers. And of course, I had to be confident first that the system was reliable. So I tested that system, you know, to the nth degree. NASA would be proud of me if I were a rocket, you know, because I'm testing. And then what I found with clients was, I have to tell you something, Carl, most of my readings are blind. In other words, people send me their birth details. 90% of my clients are from America, Canada, and Australia. I don't know who they are. They just send me their birth details. Often, you know, I want this. And so it's amazing when you get feedback saying, well, that's amazing. Because some people will already have a sense of vocation or a sense of their purpose. So they're in a position to say, well, yeah, you know, yes, I am an accountant, or yes, I am interested in microanalysis and blah, because there will be a material site, not just spiritual. Draconic can actually work out what your practical purpose is as well as your spiritual. So when you're getting that kind of feedback from strangers through a blind reading, this strengthened my confidence in astrology, because by nature, I'm quite skeptical, even now. I sometimes say, well, this is a load of rubbish. And I have to keep testing the system and refining it. What it is, uh, in complete contrast to this, which is a specialist book, this is for muggles. And I forgive me the, the expression, but really it's for people who are interested in astrology, but you know, you've read a lot of astrology books, maybe, and you think, well, what are they talking about? You know, what, it, what? but this book is designed for people who are interested in the subject. It's got lots of pretty pictures. And what I've done is I've deconstructed the subject so that by the end of it, and it's not that long, it's quite heavy, though. I mean, you could knock someone out with this book or you could wipe out an ant's nest if you dropped it on it. <laughs> uh, you can see I've still got sociopathic tendencies. <laughs> but um. If, but so this is a book to give to your auntie Edna if she's interested in astrology or for yourself or your cat and by the end of it you will have actually a pretty good understanding of how to read a chart because it it doesn't pretend anymore that we manually construct charts we actually use computers software programs so I've got a lot, good guide to free software programs on the internet you can use to set up your own chart My website, victoroliver.co.uk, that's Oliver with two L's. I'm not called Keith, as some <laughs> people call me. And some people call me Oliver. Um, it's Victor Oliver, O L L. So it's victoroliver.co.uk. And you can drop me a message, email me, be rude, I don't care. And uh, there's a range of services, all priced, so you can choose what you want to do. There is a waiting list, though, I have to warn you. Okay. But you can ask me questions about Draconic. I don't mind being asked questions. Thank you, Watkins Books. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.